It is good to see everyone this morning. Hope everyone is doing well today. You might be turning over to Revelation chapter 3. Appreciate everyone being here. Appreciate the visitors that we have this morning as well. And if you are a visitor, we have been going through the churches of Asia. In Revelation chapters 2 and 3, we are on the sixth church, so we are beginning to wrap this study up. Um, but if you, uh, if you have not been following along, and if you're visiting, I assume that you haven't, you know how the whole thing begins is John is on the island of Patmos. He's, on, he's in exile. Patmos is a little island off of the coast of modern-day Turkey. And these churches, beginning with Ephesus and then the others, these are congregations, these are cities that are just on the western portion, the mainland of Turkey. And we'll look at a map or two as, as we go through this sermon. But that's, that's, where, that's where we are. So we are ready for chapter 3 and the Church of Philadelphia. Um, needless to say, just because we also have a city here named Philadelphia, you probably know what the name of the city means, that it is the city of brotherly love. Philadelphia, actually, a little bit of history about the city is it was the youngest of the cities of Asia Minor. That it was only, it was only a couple hundred years old uh, compared to some of the other cities that we've looked at that were five, six, seven hundred years old. And so it's, it's a fairly young city. It got its name because a king, somewhere around 200 B.C., if I'm remembering correctly, King Attalus, um, he, he had a brother that he cared for, um, his brother Eumenes. And, and so as the city was founded, Attalus, they, they gave the name in honor of King Attalus' love for his brother, hence the name Philadelphia. It was established, the city itself was established for a different reason than some of the other cities. Some of the other cities, they were like military outposts and, you know, there, there was a strategic place and, okay, we're going to build a city there for that purpose. Philadelphia, it was, it was established for the express purpose, not of, not of fighting, not military, but it was the express purpose of spreading Greek culture. It was in a unique place geographically in that it was like a border city. And so it was established for that purpose, just to influence and to spread Greek culture. And it was very successful in doing that. That that is, at the time you might think about Alexander the Great, various things like that. They were wanting to spread their culture throughout that land and really get the culture to take hold. So it was a city of influence, not military influence, but cultural influence, especially in, in the Greek time. Now, concerning the church, uh, we, we've looked at the city, but concerning the church, one of the things that's interesting about it is you have seven churches. Five of them, the Lord, with, with five of them, there are commendations and then there are condemnations. So one or two of them, the Lord doesn't have anything good to say hardly at all. Um, with others, they may have done a lot of good like Ephesus, but they had left their first love. So the Lord tells them what's wrong, what's right. But with two of the congregations, and Philadelphia is one of the two, the Lord has nothing, he doesn't have anything negative to say. And so it is the faithful church in Philadelphia. I'd like to read the account again that we read a moment ago. Revelation 3, just go through it, and as we go through here, just, just try to remember some of these phrases and figures. Revelation 3, verse 7. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. 
He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, what lessons can we learn from the account? I want to begin by looking at the Lord's identity. The Lord says, I am he who is holy, I am he who is true. For the Christians living in Philadelphia, they had been betrayed two different ways. One way, the Lord identifies it. There were those who said they were Jews, and the Lord says, you know what, they're really not Jews. It's actually a synagogue of Satan. And the, the meaning is, it's, it's not that they weren't Jews outwardly. It's that true Jews are not those who are Jews outwardly, but those who are Jews inwardly. It's not the circumcision of the flesh, it's the circumcision of the heart. And these individuals, those, those Jews, and all you have to do is just think about it. Because this is still an issue today, if we'll just pay attention. People talk about Jews today being the people of God. And yet, if, you, if they reject the Messiah, how can anyone say they're really the people of God? Right? Well, that's what was going on back then. Some of those Jews, many of those Jews, some Jews became Christians, and they recognized Jesus as the Messiah. But a whole lot of them, namely those who claim to be Jews, but they're actually a synagogue of Satan, claiming to be God's people, but they were in no way God's people. Now, what was happening back then, and we've touched on this before, if you're a Jewish Christian living back then, likely what you would do is you would gather with the saints on Sunday. But that did not prevent you from going to synagogue on Saturday. Okay, so a lot of the a lot of the Jewish Christians would still go to synagogue and probably try to influence their Jewish brethren, like Paul talks about my zeal for Israel is that they, right? My hope for Israel is that they may be saved. They have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. So Jewish Christians would still go to synagogue on Saturday until the Jews wouldn't let them anymore. And that's what was happening. And they know that's what was happening. Because what, what and, and we, we've touched on this in previous studies, but if you weren't here, I'll, I'll touch on it again. You had the destruction of Jerusalem happening in 70 A.D. And, and the reason that Jerusalem was destroyed was because they were beginning to bear arms against Rome. They were beginning to defy Rome. And so Rome's not going to let that stand. So Rome comes in heavy-handed like they usually do. Rome comes in heavy-handed, and guess what? The Christians, Jews who had become Christians, right? You might think about submitting to government, submitting to those who are in authority. One of the main chapters about submitting to those who are in authority was written to the Christians in Rome. And so Christians would not bear arms in that situation when Jerusalem was destroyed. Now, the Jews didn't like that a whole lot. The Jews didn't like it that their Jewish brethren who had become Christians did not stand with them against Rome. And so therefore, 15, 20, 25 years later, when Roman persecution is cranking back up, the Jews, wanting to comply with Rome, they were distancing themselves from, the, from Jews who had become Christians because they didn't like the Christians at this point. They didn't care for them. And so what would happen if you were a Jewish Christian and you came on a Saturday to synagogue and you knocked on the door? A rabbi would open a little peephole and say, you are not welcome here and then close the door. And you are not allowed to go in. And they were kicking Christians, Jewish Christians, out of synagogues. Because Rome, for a time, they, they gave Caesar worship. Concerning Caesar worship, they gave exemption to Jews. To Jews. So all of a sudden, if your name is not on the synagogue's rolls, well, then you are not exempt from Caesar worship. So it was a big deal. Hopefully you're kind of following those nuances a little bit. 
All that's to say this. There's a reason Jesus says, he identifies himself, and he says, I am he who is holy, I am he who is true, and I am he who has the keys of David. The Jews do not have the keys of David. <laughs> they do not have the authority to open and shut. Jesus goes on and he says, I am he who opens and no one shuts, and I am he who shuts and no one opens. They are not the door. I am the door. All right, so he's using this figure that they would have understood. So the Christians there had been betrayed. They had been betrayed by Jews who were not Christians. They had also been betrayed by Rome. And this starts getting into the geology, the geography of, of the city itself. Philadelphia... Philadelphia was in a unique place, all right? And the emperor that we're dealing with right now is Domitian, okay? What you have up on the map, and I'm hoping it kind of shows up. Uh, it doesn't show up too well, does it? No, we don't have the best system. Well, what that is, I don't know if you can tell or not from this angle, that is a map of Turkey. Each one of those red dots, that is an extinct volcano. <laughs> That's what that is. There are extinct volcanoes all over modern-day Turkey. And so that one right there is pretty close to Philadelphia. All right? They're extinct volcanoes. Hang on to that little thought, because if there's that many extinct volcanoes, what does that tell you about probably the seismic activity in the region? And you think about plate tectonics and things like that. So all sorts of faults over in that land. So it's in a unique place. You have all these extinct volcanoes. Now, if you know anything at all about volcanoes, after the volcanoes are extinct, it makes the land itself very, very rich. Okay? And so this is a picture of the vineyards in Philadelphia. It was actually known back then, we'll read a quote here in just a second, it was known for its world-class vineyards. Because of the extinct volcano, the land is so rich and that the, the, the vineyards, and of course talking about wine and things like that, it was world class. It was even in the world's eyes, it was starting to become better than Rome's. It was starting to become better than Italy's. Now, how do you think Domitian felt about that? Oh, he didn't like that a whole lot at all. But that's what was happening. You have this quotation, for, this is from William Barclay. Philadelphia had a great characteristic which has left its mark upon this letter. It was on the edge of the great plain called the, and I won't even try to pronounce it, which means the burned land. That place, it was a great volcanic plain bearing the marks of the lava and the ashes of volcano, then extinct such land as fertile. And Philadelphia was the center of a great grape growing area and a famous producer of wines, but that situation had its perils, you don't say. So Domitian, out of jealousy, because he doesn't like it that their vineyards were starting to become better than Rome's vineyards, Domitian put out an edict, put out a law that said all of their vineyards all had to be cut down. This was their livelihood. This was, this was their trade. And so when the Lord says, I am he who is holy and true, Domitian had betrayed them. The Roman emperor had, had betrayed the city. And, and of course, the Christians there, those who had been here, things like that, they, they felt horribly betrayed by Rome. Rome who claimed to be their friend. See if this just doesn't sound familiar. Rome who claimed to be their friend. You ever known of politicians in this day and age to claim to be your friend? And then guess what? They're really not your friend at all. Believe it or not, believe it or not, it usually doesn't work that way. But then there's the Lord. And the Lord is holy and the Lord is true. And the Lord would not, the Lord would not shut the door on them. The Lord would not forget about them. And the Lord would not betray them. He's holy, he's true. He does not betray his citizens. The second point I want to make talks about the open door. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door. Now, what door is that? 
I'll give you two options for the door, and there's probably more options than that. One is, he may be speaking about himself. Right? We know in the Gospel of John, he says, I am the door. No man comes to the Father except, right? You have that, that figure when he speaks about that. I think I'm hashing up two passages, but he refers to himself as the door. So he may be speaking about that idea of having access to God through him. That may be the figure. But another opportunity, and I, I, I kind of lean this way just because it's connected with their works. Verse 8, I know your works. See, I've set before you an open door. There are places in Scripture, one of them where Paul talks about, he was asking for the prayers of the saints, and he talks about a great and open, a great door has been opened for me, and he's talking about evangelism. He's talking about being able to spread the gospel. And so what's interesting about, if it is that, remember, here Philadelphia is, and they have been... The city was built specifically here because they were able to have an influence on all of Asia Minor. And so what's interesting about that there are actually maps. All the churches that we've looked at, all the cities we've looked at, they actually know the road that all those churches are on. You're actually following a route. You're following a route and it's kind of curving around as you're looking at it and going eastward. Into, into the body of modern-day Turkey. So as, the, as this news is traveling, and you might think about how each one of these passages ends, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. These messages are not meant exclusively just for these seven churches. They're meant for anyone else, including us, to learn from. And so you have this city that was built specifically because it was in a place where it could easily influence others. It's... it's <laughs> It's at that crossroads. And all that's to say this. Those same roads that allowed for Greek influence of the area are the same roads the gospel is going to take. When the Lord says, I set before you an open door, and it's connected to their works. And all that's to say this. There's one more church that we're going to look at. Not today. Next week it's Laodicea. How much... How much evangelism do you think was going on in Laodicea? The lukewarm church. Uh, not too much. Well, that's the last church before we close our study. So if, if the gospel is going to continue on eastward, are you going to hang your hat on Laodicea? Probably not. Are you going to hang your hat on Philadelphia? They're faithful. They're faithful. Some of, the, some of the commentators and scholars that write about Philadelphia, they make the point, and it's interesting, that there, there was Christianity in Philadelphia when, when in the coming centuries from this point forward, all of the other cities are going to fall. Eventually, they're all going to fall to, they're all going to, fall to Muslim doctrine. As, as the Muslim doctrine would spread, and you start getting into, uh, there's a reason it's not Constantinople anymore, it's Istanbul, all right? And you have Muslim doctrine. But even when, even as Muslim doctrine took hold in so many different places, guess where one of the places was where there was still Christianity? It's Philadelphia. And that as the Lord commends them and encourages them to hold fast to what they had, it looks like they did. It looks like they did. The open door. The open door. Might, might consider, whatever the case is, when the Lord says, I have set before you an open door, don't disconnect it from he who opens and no one shuts and he who shuts and no one opens. But I'll also say this, I want you to connect it. And the reason that I wonder if it's not speaking more about evangelism is because of verse, it's because of verse 12. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. In thinking about the figure, and we'll talk more about that figure here in a second, when he says, I set before you an open door. Well, what do you do with a door? You go through it. But yet it's a different 
it must be speaking about something different later on when he says, you shall go out no more. It's speaking about something subtly different. You might just think about, think about that idea. That's why I lean more towards the first one in verse 8, speaking about evangelism and the spreading of the gospel, things like that. And I'll say all, all, all that to say this. We should be praying for opportunities. We should be praying for doors to be opened. And if that door is open to crack, you know what we should be doing? Put your foot in the door. <laughs> right? If you have an opportunity to speak to someone, we need to be taking full advantage of those opportunities and we need to be praying for those opportunities. Because opportunities don't necessarily have to come along too often. That it's the Lord who opens, it's the Lord who shuts. So if the, if the door has been opened, then we have an obligation. Let's talk about the Lord's promise now. It says, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, verse 9, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet. Uh, I think other versions, I will make them come and bow down before you or come and bow down at your feet, I believe. The Christians are promised, verse 10 says, Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial. So whatever that trial is, whatever is being spoken about, the Lord says, I'm going to keep you from that. Now those Jews, the house of the, the synagogue of Satan, they're not given that promise. And so it looks like, perhaps, that in the hour of trial that the Jews would come and seek their favor. And there is, well, I was watching a video on this, and there's a real good series about all these churches on, on YouTube by a fella. Anyway, you can search it. It's usually the first one that pulls up. And he referenced when Joseph's brothers come to Egypt. The Lord had favored Joseph. His brothers, the family, there's the time of the famine. So what do they have to do? They have to come bow down to Joseph. That's what they have to do. And that whatever's going on here, the Lord says, in keeping them from the hour of trial, He was going to cause those who said they were Jews but were liars, He was going to cause them to come and bow down before the Christians, the faithful. So it looks like whatever's going on, the Jews would come to seek favor in the hour of trial. All that's to say this. In Romans chapter 11, when you have this description of Jews and Gentiles, and you have this, this discussion of the native branches and the unnatural branches, and it talks about the natural branches being cut off. In the midst of all of that discussion, if you're familiar with it, the Lord says, I am doing this to provoke them to jealousy. And the Lord had a unique way of provoking the Jews to jealousy. The Jews who did not believe in the Messiah. And it looks like this may have been another place, another way that it would have happened. The Lord's promise goes on, and it's the verse we are already read. Verse 12. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. That is a figure that they understood extremely well. This figure of, I will... They will go out no more. There's two options for that. One is, we're back to the Jews ostracizing them from the synagogues, saying, get out. That's, that's one option. And the Lord may have been just using these figures that they would have understood because there's a, another figure as well. So you remember that map that had all the volcanoes on it? And I said, what do you think the seismic activity was like in the area? And guess what? In, in the year 17 AD, there was a ginormous earthquake. I don't even know if giant, yeah, ginormous is a word. There was a huge earthquake in 17 AD. This is just from Wikipedia, okay? And I don't know if you can read that. I'll, I'll read it quickly. The AD 17 Lydia earthquake caused the destruction of at least 12 cities in the region of Lydia in the Roman province of Asia and Asia Minor, now part of Turkey. The earthquake was recorded by the Roman historians Tacitus and Pliny the Elder and the Greek historians Strabo and Eusebius. 
Pliny called it the greatest earthquake in human history. The city of Sardis, right? We're dealing with cities that we've been speaking about. The city of Sardis, the former capital of the Lydian Empire, was the most affected and never completely recovered from the destruction. This is AD 17. This is well before this letter. So I wonder if another figure, because Sardis was just last week. That's the dead church. I know you have a name. You think you're alive, but you're dead. And I wonder if the Lord is not using a figure because they never recovered from that earthquake. He's making a spiritual application from something that they would have understood. But anyway, that's Sardis. Damage. Historical records list up to 15 towns and cities that were destroyed or damaged by the earthquake. Sardis, that's on our list. Magnesia, Timnos, Philadelphia, that's on our list. Asia, Apollonis, Mostine, Hyrcanus, Hierapolis, that's right next to Laodicea, by the way. Marina, all those others, Pergamum, Ephesus, Kibra, all those cities are destroyed in 17 AD. Okay? They're all destroyed. Philadelphia, that may have been a little closer to the epicenter. You have this earthquake, but after an earthquake, what do you have? You keep having tremors. And the tremors in Philadelphia went on and on and on. And so one of the people that speaks about it is, and he was mentioned in that Wikipedia entry, is Strabo. So this is from Strabo's Geography, if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. It says, after the Lydians came the Mycenaeans and the city Philadelphia, ever subject to earthquakes. Incessantly, the walls of the houses are cracked, different parts of the city being thus affected at different times. For this reason, but few people live in the city and most of them spend their lives as farmers in the country. Now, what had Domitian done? Most lived as farmers in the country since they have a fertile soil. Yet one may be surprised at the few that they are so fond of the place when their dwellings are so insecure, that what they were constantly doing, other, others that speak about the idea or, or the situation, you're in, you're in your house. Y- y'all have seen on, on the news in, in countries over there and sometimes in third world countries, when there's an earthquake, what happens to their dwellings? It's not good, right? It's not good. So when an earthquake starts, what are you going to do? You're going to hunker down in a hall or are you going to go outside? And so what was happening in Philadelphia as the tremors kept happening, And the city was already destroyed in 17 AD, but whatever was left and whatever is rebuilt, every time there's a tremor, people were going in and out of their house. And that's what life was like. They're going in and out until finally they just couldn't take it anymore. And they're dwelling outside of the city as farmers growing these vineyards. And then Domitian says, cut them down. Really? So when the Lord comes along and the Lord says... You're not going to have to go out anymore, right? I know the Jews have kicked you out of the synagogue. I know the earthquakes have driven you from your homes. That's not what the Lord's kingdom is going to be like. You're going to dwell there. I'm going to make you a pillar in the temple. Some of the ruins of Philadelphia, it's interesting. All all the pillars, guess what? They've all fallen down. (laughs) What do you think happened in the earthquake? As the city is destroyed, all the pillars fall down. Those pillars that man built that they thought were so stable were toppled. The Lord's Lord's pillars, they're a little more secure than that. They're a little more secure than that. So we have the Lord's promise. Verse 12, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. Back to verse 10. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you. Because they had kept God's word, the Lord would keep them. The Lord's promise. I will write on him a new name. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. I will write on him my new name. 
One of the other interesting things about Philadelphia is that it kept being renamed. <laughs> it was originally given the name Philadelphia, and that's the name that it would always go back to. But that earthquake that happened in 17 AD that destroyed all those cities, the Caesar at the time, Rome at the time, what they ended up doing was waiving taxes and tribute for five years for all those cities so that those cities could, could rebuild. Now, I don't know about you, but if someone comes along, if, if the government comes along and says, you don't have to pay any income tax for five years. I don't know about you, but we're going out to party. <laughs> okay? So when that happened, how much do you think, how, how much did those cities appreciate Rome waiving taxes for five years? So now all of a sudden, Philadelphia renamed itself Neo Caesarea out of gratitude to Caesar, the new Caesarea. So they were thankful that the Caesar at the time in 17 AD had done that. So all of a sudden, the city has a new name. A little bit later, when Rome does something else in their favor, they rename the city after um, Flavius. And it's given, another, it's given another name. Now eventually, it keeps going back to Philadelphia. But it's like it has a new name for, for a certain amount of time. So when the Lord says, I'm giving you a new name, I will write on him my new name. That city was well aware that they kept getting renamed. It's Philadelphia and then Neo-Caesarea and then Vespasia. <laughs> Keeps getting a new name. And the Lord says, I'm going to give you a new name and it's going to stick. It's going to stick. And so when we think about the Lord who is holy and true, and the Lord who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens and things along those lines. Think what it's speaking about here when, he's, when the Lord says, I will write on him my new name. I think it's the idea of ownership. Right? It's like they are my people. Not the synagogue of Satan. They are my people. They belong in the new city and the name of the name of God. I want you to come over to chapter 19 as we begin to wrap things up. Over in chapter 19, and thinking about, I will write on him a new name. Romans, or pardon me, Revelation 19, verse 11. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He is Lord of Lords, after all. On his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth has gone a sharp sword, goes a sharp sword, and with it, uh, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And there's Jesus. There's Jesus. You know, as we've gone through these studies, a lot of folks, they have questions about Revelation. And so that's one reason we're going through these these churches. This is what this is how it starts. So when the Lord says, I will write a name on them. King of kings, Lord of lords, and his name is called the Word of God. Look over in chapter 22. In chapter 22 at verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Family and I just took time to go down south. Went down and stayed for a few days in, in, in actually Vidalia, Mississippi. No, Vidalia, Louisiana, pardon me. Across the Mississippi is Natchez. 
Natchez, the city in Mississippi. But anyway, you go down there and you just stay on the river and you watch the world go by. There's a building right next to where, right next to our hotel, and it says "Heal Your Soul." There's a little graffiti on it, a little painting of a pelican. Heal your soul. Any of y'all ever seen the Mississippi? Out of curiosity, I figure surely some have. Mississippi's given various names. One of them speaking to how muddy it is, because it is, especially when it's been raining up north. I mean, it's just it's. I like it, <laughs> but it is, it's a muddy river. Actually, the delta, since how we used to live down there, the delta where the Mississippi dumps into the Gulf of Mexico, that is getting built up from all the sediment that the Mississippi brings into it. So it actually, the, that, that, elta, that area right there, the delta, it actually, <laughs> the water is getting more and more shallow all the time. You can actually see from space the sediment coming down. All that's to say this, when the Apostle John looks and he sees, and there is a, a river of water of life clear as crystal. And what an amazing thing. And this is where you really have the healing. The healing of the nations, there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. His servants shall serve him, they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. The saved have the Lord's name on their foreheads. What's, what's God say? I will write my law in their minds and on their hearts. It's talking about ownership, but it's also talking about following the Lord and having, having His commands, having the Word, having the Word always, always before us. As we offer the invitation and as we think about the faithful church, we can be faithful. We can be faithful. We do not have to hear what the other churches, the other churches, what did they hear? I have this against you. Yes, you've done all this, but this is a problem. I have this against you. And that's what the other churches, five of them, that's what they heard. They either heard, I have this against you, or they heard, you're dead, or they heard, you're lukewarm, and I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. We don't have to hear that. We have an opportunity to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. What's the difference between the two? What's the difference between someone who hears, well done, thou good and faithful servant, and someone who hears, depart from me, you workers of iniquity? You know, as, as we've looked at the churches, I wanted to be sure to mention this. There are different variables throughout each of the letters to the churches. All right? Jesus, Jesus identifies Himself a different way with each one. There are different figures used. But there's also a universal... There, there are universal things throughout each letter. And the universal ones are, in each one, Jesus says, I know your works. Ephesus, I know your works. Chapter 2, verse 2. Chapter 2, verse 9. Smyrna, I know your works. Chapter 2, verse 13. Pergamos, I know your works. Chapter 2, verse 19. I know your works. Each one, it's constant. So what do you think the difference is between, well done, thou, well done, thou good and faithful servant, and depart from me, you workers of iniquity. What's the difference? It's what we do. <laughs> it's what we do, and that doesn't take away from God's grace at all. It's how do we react to the Word of God. Another constant with each one, you have here in Philadelphia, here in Philadelphia, it's verse 13. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Every church, the Lord says that to. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So when we're about to sing, God calling yet. And that's what we're about to sing. God calling yet. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Respond. Respond to it. Respond to the gospel. If you're not a Christian, if you're not a Christian, 
this morning in Bible class, we spoke about Jesus and Nicodemus, and we spoke about being born again. And Jesus defined what it means to be born again when He says, born of water and the Spirit. And in the same chapter, there are baptisms taking place. He who has an ear, what, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Respond to the Gospel. God is yet calling. He's still calling. Will sinners come? Because the church in Philadelphia, they were sinners too, you know. <laughs> they weren't perfect. They were perfect. But how were they dealing with things? How were they dealing with issues? How were they dealing with sin? Were they just allowing sin to go on in their lives? Or were they turning from sin and following the Lord? Were they allowing the Jews who were the house of Satan, the synagogue of Satan, were they being overcome by them? Or were they overcoming evil with good? When Domitian did what he did, the option are, options are, where are you going to turn? Where are you going to turn? Where are you going to turn? Peter had the right answer. Where shall we go? You have the words of life. <laughs> it's the only, he's, he's the only answer. He's the only answer. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through Him. And for all of the other, all the other stuff, please tell me anybody in the world outside of Jesus who has an answer for death. Tell me anyone who has an answer for death. We just had those. Sister Pat just went to a funeral this past week. Pat, I won't ask you. How many funerals? Yeah, I guess I did ask you. How many funerals have you been to in your life? A lot. How many funerals have you all been to? Some of the funerals we've all gone to together, probably. Others, you may have just been by yourself. How many people are in here are going to have funerals? Have you all prepared for that? I mean, like, you know, bought a plot, gravestone. You know where you're going to be buried, cremated, whatever. You know, people make plans. People make plans. <laughs> I was actually talking to someone over in Indiana. A lady had passed away. She had her plans so meticulous, she even told the person who led the singing what they were going to wear when they led the song she picked out. <laughs> Jerry Lancaster was going to wear this suit with that tie. <laughs> and yes, that's what it was. But how do we really prepare for death? That's Jesus. That's Jesus. And that's why we're faithful. That's why we walk that straight and narrow path. Because we will all go through that door at some point. In all likelihood unless the Lord returns first. So if you're not a Christian, prepare yourself. Be faithful. And what that looks like, that looks like turning from sins, confessing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, being baptized, the water is always ready, being baptized for the remission of your sins, rising to walk in newness of life, and faithfulness to the Lord, and that's what Philadelphia was doing. That's what the church there was doing. They were being faithful. The lesson is yours. If you're here this morning and need to respond, come forward. Let it be known that you want to become a Christian. And we will gladly do our part. And God, more importantly, will do His part with Jesus. Being born of water, born of the Spirit. If you are a Christian, but if you've been unfaithful, you have an opportunity to repent. All of these churches... Even the five that the Lord condemns, some actions they do, what does the Lord say in every one of those? Repent, repent, repent. He's still merciful. He's still merciful. He's long-suffering. So if you are a Christian, but if you've been unfaithful, repent while there's still time. Please come this morning while we stand and sing the invitation.